All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ahmad huwa wa salli ala Rasul al-Kareem. Amma ba'd. Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasalli amri. Wa ahlul uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli amin ya Rabb. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about a sensitive topic. Um, and uh, I have a brother that's been, you know, working with this topic or this issue, which is really uh, arms or self-defense. Um, and we're really in a time where masjids, Muslim institutions, um, uh, Muslim homes need to uh, protect themselves, especially Muslims in the West, more than ever before. And so I'm going to let uh, Brother Muhammad start off the conversation and then uh, we'll take it from there, inshallah. All right. Salam alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you, Mawana Umar, for letting me on um, here with you. I'm honored to be here and I'm glad that I have the opportunity to uh, speak to my brothers and sisters about uh, this topic. Though it is a touchy one, I think it is a very uh, important topic that I believe has a lot of myths and misunderstandings. And, um, you know, things that people may have their own ideas about. Um, hopefully I can do my best to try and share what I have learned from uh, a lot of friends that I have and my own experiences. Um, um, I think it's definitely something that um, is um, a sort of far da'in to learn to know about. And um, inshallah ta'ala, um, I'll do my best to try and give that knowledge to you guys. So, um, first thing I want to talk about is the basics. Um, um, knowing the the idea of what security is and what it is not, um, we don't want to um, give anybody the idea that we're here to try and uh, create um, Rambo's or um, have any um, idea of false security. Uh, when it comes to security, you have to be very realistic. Otherwise, um, things fail and people get hurt, and that's obviously what we're trying to avoid here. Um, I was asked to speak about uh, mosques security. Um, when it comes to masajid, um, Mawana Umar was speaking to me about the, um, the, the, the things that we as Muslims and as minorities face in this um, atmosphere here in America and to be honest around the world for that for that for that for that matter. Um, but like Muslims in, this, in India are being persecuted and they're minority, right? Yeah. Uh, Muslims in Palestine also. But that's a little bit more complicated, so we're not going to talk about that per se today. But uh, but Muslims, especially in the West, in the UK, Muslims in Germany, Muslims in America. Yes. Yeah. This is the, of course, we are in a bit of a you know melting pot here, so we are obviously at a uh, higher risk. So when it comes to masajid, security is relative depending on which your masajid's purpose is, the kind of programs that are held there. Um, the members that go there, of course, these are all things that have to be considered in security. There's so many factors that have to be put into security plans, and that's why uh, I can't go into too many detail uh, online here. Um, however, if you, if you have a security team at your mosque, definitely try and reach out to your local experts. There are many of them out there who could talk to you about developing a proper security plan. This does not include you going online and looking up somebody else's security plan. Your mosque has its own um, risk, its own weaknesses, and it has to be um, assessed by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, what's important is that um, you educate yourselves um, <coughs> realistically um, on measures that have to be taken. If you are, um, per se, like a, someone who is going to the mosque and um, happens to have, you know, he's a key holder there, right? You have a responsibility. You are going to be someone that if someone is to be watching the place, you're going to be someone that they're going to um, look out for. If you're a leader at the mosque, same thing. You, you, these these core members have the responsibility first on them, and then that responsibility falls to the members of the congregation to keep an eye out and to be more aware. Um, this responsibility first, of course, starts all the way from your home, believe it or not, until you get to the mosque because um, security first starts just like self-change or um, islah, you know, it first starts at the home on a personal level, then to the family, and then to the community, and then so on and so forth. So likewise with security, you have to first be a security-minded person in your 
self. You cannot um, say, you know what, when I'm at work, I'm not security minded, but at the masjid, I'm going to be security minded. Um, we see. I think that's a very important point, and don't lose your chain of thought. But, you know, in the olden days, or in the time of the Prophet, or part of Fatua, right? Or Muslims in, before the industrial age, people were very security minded, right? They were very, like, mindful of who's on that street. Uh, people were mind, much more mindful of their surroundings if there's a stranger walking by or you know and and sometimes uh, that itself is also a very good first start right uh, is is just having that mindset of okay um, you know who's this person we've never seen him before uh, alhamdulillah for our community uh, because of Asif and also because of uh, Masjid Zakaria here there's always, whenever something happens around here, there's always conversations of, okay, you know, have we ever seen this person before? I mean, we have a you know, good number of people that, are that, 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 uh, that have developed that security mind in, in our jama over here. So it's very, very important because the person that's going to be a target is the one that's unaware. Exactly. And that's, that's very evident on your uh, body language. Um, someone who's not aware of their surroundings is um, some, someone who's watching. Um, a predator would definitely be able to see that on your uh, in your body language if your head's not on a swivel if you're not moving in a certain way um, these are all things that can be seen in your um, behavior from someone who's who, uh, who's looking to attack you um, and just to touch on this point um, that he made Malama made that everyone in old communities if there was a war per se you had everyone from your warriors all the way to the regular blacksmiths who knew how to use a sword who knew how to defend their home and the city so just keep that in mind that this is not something new that we're bringing to the table here this is something that was has has and always has been a part of the um communities is this this uh, warrior breed of men that has always been a part of um cities and communities um and mindset is and is 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 the beginning and the end of any defense scenario um, if you have situational awareness there's a saying in the special forces community that if you have situational awareness you can either be guaranteed to win a gunfight or be guaranteed to not even get, get in one in the first place and I mentioned gun there but there can be any type of um, self-defense scenario that you might find yourself in where you might have to use a coffee mug your keys your phone anything that you have on your person, and uh, these, these are all things that you know you, you may find yourself using. But just to get back to our point here is that this this idea of um, security mindset begins first at home and within yourself, and it has to become a part of your personality. And these are things that can be developed, and not only for um, law enforcement, and not only for um, the military um, um, uh, uh, members. These are for people who just want to be safe and keep their family safe. Um, now, what you'll see. Um, pretty often is that when these conversations get started is that people are aware and they get to think about the extremes and you know I don't want to go too much into it I just want to basically defend myself that's fine and I, I totally understand that we should be aware of the extremes uh, we don't want to go into extremes and get paranoid the key here is to be responsive and not reactive if you are responsive, you're more likely to be calmer, you're more likely to assess a situation and to respond to it, as opposed to just reacting and not knowing how to respond and using your basic human instincts, and that might not always be the best way to go. You want to have your instincts trained, and they are still instincts, but they're trained. Um, so, yeah, Another aspect that I think that's very important as time progresses, and which we'll talk about in a little bit, but is that also to be uh, mindful of the women and the sisters, right? One of the things that's happened is men were extremely uh, cautious of their women folk, yes. right? And were extremely protective of their women folk. Like, I still remember older people uh, like that. Uh, Brother Muhammad in our Jama'ah is like yeah. that. He's mm -hmm. very much like that, right? Yeah. So, uh, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that. Uh, we are coming back into those times where that mindset of being aware in terms of security for yourself, but especially the sisters, right? Um, unfortunately, nowadays, everyone has this false sense of security, 
even though there may be women being raped every three seconds, there's somebody being battered every 10 seconds, or I forget what, you know, all these things are happening, but we have this false sense of security. Um, and if you don't have this, and, and as the situation of the world gets worse, which is inevitable at this point, in my opinion, I think the dice has been cast. That the direction economically, spiritually, morally, politically is on a downtrend for as far as the foreseeable future can tell. Um, we could talk a little bit about that. But I think, uh, Brother Muhammad, don't forget what you were in your chain of thought. But I want you to address many Muslims, especially immigrants, right? Especially, and I'll, I'll tell you something interesting about my sheikh when he came to America and the African-American uh, Muslim community and the relationship, right? Um, so when Dr. Sir when he came to America, he came on one of the one of the times he came, he came on an invitation of a Muslim African American Muslim, uh, Imam Rami, who had studied in Syria, okay. and then so he uh, came back to America and he established a masjid and he he wanted to invite our Sheikh to America. So when he invited our sheikh to America, you know, uh, he had his brothers, like the people that were around him, like be a security guard for him, right? And he was like, even 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 we, like his students, didn't do that yeah. level of kind of like service, like, yeah, we're gonna stand at the door and while you sleep, kind of like, <laughs> you know, we're gonna what? We're gonna make sure you're okay, okay? We're gonna make sure, you know, no, no, you stay here. We're gonna bring the car to you. You know, your safety is important to us. The Nation of Islam had this. Oh yeah, right. And so he came very much from that. So, so the African American Muslims, who are sons of the soil, right? They're not scared, really, with the idea of security and showing power or exerting power, not aggression, power, uh, exerting power or showing power or showing uh, uh, awareness. Of security, but our colonized Muslims from the Arab world, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from like if you say to them, brother, we need to, you know, have at least a few people. I mean, everyone should, but I'm just saying as a scenario, if you say to a board member, you know, we should make it a point that everybody important should try to get a gun. Uh, Many Muslims will react by saying, oh, no, no, that would make me a bad citizen. Mm. Or we're just simply scared of what that would, how we would be interpreted. Uh, and I think that is the result of this colonialism. And it's a result of fear, which basically puts you in a state of submission. But then the final result will be when you do need to be able to stand up for yourself, you're, you're going to be at a complete loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, so can you speak to that also? For sure. Um, I think that when it comes to the idea of people, uh, you know, succumbing to this idea of guns being the the modern like boogeyman and uh, some, for some reason it's the gun's fault for uh, a lot of the, the misfortunate events that happen in our society. Um, that's basically a, a result of... Um, certain people in our uh, media just putting out a lot of false information and putting out things that, you know, incite fear and, um, you know, lies, to be honest, to be st uh, quite straightforward. Uh, growing up, I grew up um, at a mosque that was sort of came out of the post-Nation of Islam um, era. A lot of these guys that I spent time with um, from, you know, very young, from like 12 and up, um, they were former guards of uh, Malcolm X. Some of these guys were very close to Malcolm X, and they were from a group that maybe Miller Umbers are familiar with, it, um, the FOI. And I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time with these guys. We went to Detroit to a lot of the conventions, and um, a part of that convention was they had some of the young men uh, work and learn about security. It was, it was really important. So when we came back to Buffalo, here in Buffalo, we were at um, a mosque um, on film called Mesha Nutman. And this, this masjid, I was a part of the security team. And what would happen was, if as long as we we had order amongst our team there, local law enforcement, usually, you know, because we, we don't have that order and that 
in that in the uh, team there, you're at the mercy of law enforcement. You get wait until they get there. Wait until they yeah, respond. especially after COVID. Don't expect them to like, uh, you know, respond anytime quick to yep. your calls. I mean, we had a situation where we had to wait. What was it? Twenty minutes where we called, uh, and it like I mean, twenty minutes. A thousand things can happen. Yeah, a lot of things can happen in twenty minutes, especially when it comes to violence. Um, so. Uh, what ended up what, what ended up happening is that we had a certain bond with the police there, where if we had an issue and someone called it in and they gave our location, the police knew that it was being taken care of, and we got a call from the station asking us for a sit rep, and they had trusted us to handle it because um, we had you know guys who were former FOI, as I said before, I and mean, we also had retired law enforcement there, so um, I had I had the, the honor of experiencing that, and it was very um orderly it wasn't just um everyone um who had a gun um slid at the door it was a system uh just to kind of g- g- uh, give you an idea for Jumu'ah, there was an there was an outside um element there too but for inside there was someone at the imam's door uh at was preparing for his talk in his office and there was at every um threshold from his office to the masjid there was a man there right at every threshold and as the as one as an imam left his office, the man from that door walked to the second threshold. He would take that second threshold. The man who is the, the second threshold would leave the, the second threshold, go to the third threshold, and like like and, and like that they trade off right until the end of Jumaa and then back to their original for, for, um, formation. So this is what I grew up um, seeing and doing, um, and we did. Um, um, things like whenever we went to um, conventions in, the, in in Detroit, we learned how to be in a vehicle with them. But even to down to how we sat at the subway in um, in Detroit, we sat in in, in in a certain way. And as a kid, it had always intrigued me, and this is why I'm still into the idea of defense um, as an adult because that's what I was exposed to as a kid. So, and that goes back to the idea of uh, most classic communities as 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 youth growing up. Even if it was a wooden sword, you learned how to use a sword. And a sword wasn't looked at as a scary tool to kill people. It was it was something that, you know, you used as a man and you kept it on you no matter no matter where where where, where you went. Even when um the Rasul and his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they had went to uh try to go for Umrah the first time, they didn't go there for, for, for battle. Yet they had their swords. So it just gives you an idea that the sword is not a uh or a weapon per se isn't meant for um harm um um only. It can it can be a tool used for survival. I mean blade can be used to cut many things, not just uh, human flesh. So um the idea of owning a firearm is really um important to understand. Not just to okay, you know, yeah it's good to have a firearm. You have to understand that it's a tool. It's not um it's not something that you buy, you put it in your drawer and okay, alhamdulillah, I'm safe. That's not how that how that how that how that works. Um owning a firearm is to have a tool in case the situation um 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 re- requires it. It's not to um show off, you know, you might see some people who buy these firearms and put them online or they might buy a firearm and it caused them to do really silly things um, which ends up leading to them being demonized and uh, people feeling like you know if I buy one am I like this person no educate yourself one of the people that I take a lot of my um, um, knowledge from his name is uh, Travis Haley you can definitely look him up online he has a lot of um, 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 courses that, 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 that you can look up both online and also in person um, he his his key term is thinkers before shooters, is that when you um, own a weapon in general, thought always comes before action, and when it doesn't is when you find a lot of these harms that creep into um, um, these uh, uh, communities, and um, when you get into the wrongs of people who don't have a mind, let alone think, they do really um, heinous acts. So it isn't the weapon itself; it's the person that um, that that owns it. Um, just to touch on more of what a weapon a gun is not for, a gun is not, as I said before, to show off. Um, the moment you have a gun, a knife, a weapon in general, and it's displayed 
in this environment we're not talking about back then back then you had your sword and it was seen by, by everyone else because everyone else had a sword it was it was a little different uh, dynamic but nowadays when you are in a room and someone um and you're there in a defensive uh, capacity people who have to respond to violence are always going to be uh have the um they're going to they're going to be the underdog they have a disadvantage to someone who's going to be offensive right because you have to respond to that right and you're always you know a, a little bit behind so the 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 the, the, the right these, because the, uh, the offense the person who's launching the offense to hurt people already has a plan already has right? a plan. you don't know his plan exactly. so you're reacting to you're his reacting. to yep. him to protect others, but you don't know his plan, and you don't know who else he has. Who else him. he has? Exactly. So the, the 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 more advantage you can have, the better, right? So if I'm in a room and I'm security for for X Y Z, or I'm just here in a, in a defensive capacity, or per se you're at Walmart and you're just there with your concealed a carry, and you're there. If you're printing your firearm, or um, or or it's like it's a it's it's a situation where you're showing your weapon or a knife. You have a fixed blade that's hanging out under your shirt or whatever. If I'm there as an attacker, you're my first target because now I see that you have the ability to defend yourself and possibly stop me from doing what I'm doing. As they say in gray man theory, that the most dangerous man in the room was the one who appears to be the, the uh, um, uh, nicest, right? So um, it's really important that we understand that Weapons are not to be shown off; they're not to be brandished. Um, and number two is that weapons, guns, including, and this is that they aren't to be threatened with. So if I have a blade or a knife or whatever weapon I'm using, even if it's my keys, for that, for that, for that matter. Let's say I'm walking to my car and, I, and I, I'm, I'm unarmed, right? Maybe I'm leaving a place where I couldn't carry, um, and I'm, I feel, you know, that someone's following me. All right, I'm, and I want to put my keys between my fist I'm not gonna raise my hand up and say look it I got my key between, uh, you know you do that naturally you don't you, you, you don't want to show that because he shouldn't know that you are armed until he feels whatever force you have uh, with you be it a blade be it a weapon that's the idea these aren't uh, it's in, in New York State it's illegal to even brandish a weapon if you're not going to use it meaning that until I know that I'm that this person is a deadly threat, I need to use this firearm, this blade, this whatever I have, to stop him permanently. Then I shouldn't even show it. Only people who have the who have the um, authority to do that is, is law enforcement. They are the only ones who are able to show the, the weapon and to let and let to uh, let, let, let to, to uh, let it be known that they are are, um, are armed. As far as citizens, we cannot go to somebody who we feel. We feel is threatening us. That's important. There, you have to confirm their um, their threat level, right? And say, listen, I have a gun. Don't don't approach or whatever. In certain situations, that is that they may be needed, right? But um, it's very rare. And from a tactical standpoint, you don't want to do it um, um, at all. You want to avoid those situations where that may be needed. Um, so threatening is another reason why we, a gun isn't isn't um, is, it, it, it isn't used. Um, reasons why we do we, 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 we want to have a gun. Uh, one second here is that we want to have them um, for self defense. And when I say self defense, I mean self that includes your well being, your family's well being, and members of your community. Right? And this is life. This isn't property if someone's coming to steal your car they can have the car right you don't shoot them for trying to take your car you don't shoot somebody for you know verbal abuse you don't shoot somebody because um you know any other uh, reason besides they are now trying to take someone's life that is the only reason why you want to deploy a firearm any other reason even according to some to some laws um in certain states some states do allow you to do, to do that but as muslims we know that, that you cannot take anyone's life for any other reason besides to protect life. Okay, so um, that's that needs to be 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 be, be known before you buy a gun. Um, um, I'm also uh, when you buy a gun, you have to understand the basic uses of this tool, um, um, how to shoot it. If you have a gun and you haven't shot it before, that's a huge problem. If you have it, if you have a gun and you haven't learned how to take it apart. 
and you know and um, you know uh, do a what we call a field strip and clean that's a problem okay if you have ever taken your gun to the range and put it back in your case and you haven't cleaned it don't deploy that gun in the gunfight the gun is not ready to go that gun will probably fail and get you or someone you care about hurt um, these are all things that have to be learned after you buy a gun or to be at least studied before you buy a gun right now once you buy a gun knowing that gun is extremely important um, now um, this also depends on the capacity that you're going to be using that gun obviously if you have a weapon that you're using and it's for your you know um, your wife she should know that gun obviously you, you don't have to know every single gun that you have but the idea is that if there's a gun that you know you're going to be deploying if it's in your in the areas that you're going to be in most of the time these are um, a, um, a guns you want to be familiar with and what I mean by that is that if you're in your vehicle and you have a, a firearm in your vehicle know that firearm if you are at a place of work and let's say you work at a store and you have a gun at that store if you're a store owner know how to deploy that gun from that store if you are someone who maybe works out on the road or in the street learn learn the the, the, um, the tactics of, of urban engagement to know how to deploy that uh, firearm all right there's a lot of extremes where people get into the idea of guns and gear where they want to know how an AK works and this works and this new gun and that new gun learn your gun alright don't get into the idea of I want the coolest gun I want this gun or this gun came out now I want to learn that's that's not important and you might find that amongst uh, people who don't really know about the fence uh, we call those guns and gears guys those guys most of those guys don't know how to defend themselves truly even though they have a whole closet full of you know all the latest uh, um, 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 guns um, it's important that you are do you, you, you understand this because this is a common thing to fall into once you buy your gun because it, you know it's, it's it's cool right it's sexy it's you know yeah you know I got, I got me a new Glock got me a new Desert Eagle whatever right these are all things you you want to stay away from because um, a weapon is a weapon, a gun is a gun, and it doesn't matter what gun you have, as long as you train on it, it can be extremely effective. Right. We talk about... So if somebody has a good gun and they're not really trained, they don't go every few months to, or a few weeks, or whatever their schedule is, to like learn to shoot it, they're not going to be matched with somebody who maybe doesn't have the best gun, but he's been practicing exactly. with it. Exactly. You know, is comfortable with it, and he knows like you know, what to expect, the glitches to expect from the gun or something like that. The other thing I wanted to mention was it is extremely important for Muslims, and especially in the West, to start thinking in this direction, especially at, if not for anything, at least for Jummah. Juma. Why? Because so many Muslims are there and we're taking responsibilities as masajids for a large number of people and this will also acclimate Muslims with guns and in the community, the people that you know that are mature, right, that are in your community, they're not kids, they don't have mental health issues, they're, your community can decide, look, brother, I want you four or five people to have concealed weapons while we're in Jummah Khutbah, right? Um, and, and that is a good start even though that's still behind actually way yeah. behind because just just to like uh, throw this in you know this is from the southern poverty um uh, website right this is the uh, SPLC southern poverty law center these dots that you all see just in the united states right these are all hate groups okay these are all groups that hate uh people uh, these are all anti immigration kkk clan anti-Muslim, anti-Semite, uh, uh, anti-Semites, uh, all, all these groups are groups across the country that have sometimes up to thousands of followers, right? And especially because of what's happening in Ukraine, most Muslims are not aware of this, but Ukraine is heavily dependent upon Nazi white supremacist ideology, which they're trying to recruit as many people and promote that ideology very strongly, especially in Europe, especially in the U.S., if you look at the stories of the soldiers that went to Ukraine to fight, uh, these are all white supremacist people, okay? And and they're recruiting them. America gives them $30 billion. They're going to use a big portion of that money to recruit people, 
Okay, and, and how are they going to recruit people? They're going to recruit people using their ideology. And, and that ideology is a racist ideology. And, um, and so racism is going to increase. Crimes against Muslims are going to increase. Uh, let me just show you. Uh, I think I had this uh, thing here to show that uh, non-profit fines, uh, fines increase in hate crimes against Muslims. Okay. So it's silly for Muslim masjids, especially the bigger masjids, not to consider a serious, serious uh, ownership of their own security and not just depending upon cops. I know a lot of masjids, they'll hire cops to sit out there. But those cops, they're not going to be as serious about their own the security of the masjid as if you, as if you have your own security team. If you want to pay per hourly for cops to be there, that's fine. But you gotta still have something for your own because once things go down, it's on you at that point, exactly. right? And uh, the the, um, the 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 police community right now is very polarized for a few reasons. Number one, administration generally thinks very differently from the cops that are on the field, right? And any time a cop calls anything in, it's like he's risking himself sometimes oh, yeah. with his authority, right? And uh, and and so that leaves a very uh, messy situation. Then uh, uh, cops feel a certain way because of other movements that have started across the country, like Black, Black Lives Matter. Some cops have become very passive, right? Yep. Uh, and so all these things are happening and, you know, but what does it mean? In the end of the day, r your protection is your responsibility. Your protection is your responsibility. That's how... It, the whole world has seen it prior to the uh, industrial age. And uh, we're in some ways going back to a time where we need to take our security into our own hands. Uh, obviously, as much as possible, working with law enforcement. And uh, so this is very, very important. Muslim masjids that are serious uh, are are. are not really serious until they take the security aspect seriously. You know, because the, it just shows you're not on your feet. You don't have fatua, right? You're not real men yet. Yeah. Right? You're not real men. You're like, you're just still, uh, you're still emasculated. You're still, your manhood isn't showing itself. As soon as you take the ability to resolve conflict out of the context of manhood, you no longer have manhood. That's one of the reasons. Um, for us, Pantala, placing men on earth is for the resolution of conflict, right? This isn't, doesn't mean that war is always the answer. Of course, you know, it can be resolved with words, but as soon as you take violence out of that context, you no longer have manhood. There's a reason why the Rasul Wasallam was sent to those Arabs in that, in that, in that land. Those Arabs were warriors. It was a reason why kings and other superpowers didn't want to invade the Arab, the Arabian Peninsula because they were known to be just, you know, somewhat looked like they were barbarians. Of course, they weren't. The, the Rasul was sent to, to men who were able to become the best of, 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 uh, of nations. However, um, they were just, they were very, very tough men. And if you look at some of the battles and you hear about some of the elite warriors that were, that surrounded the Rasul, them, you will find that these men were not, um, they weren't just these um, mindless killing machines. They were extremely advanced. And if you look at the greatest um, of them, Ali, you know, Ali, we're not talking about men becoming uh, gun happy and trigger happy. We're talking about men who are disciplined, orderly, you know, um, taking up taking up the responsibility to be a defender is extremely, you know, it's not a small thing and you have to take it seriously. When Ali was in the midst of battle, we're not talking about he's standing at a master door and someone came with a, with, with a weapon. We're talking about 360 combat swords, arrows, um, spears being thrown from a distance. It's an extremely complex battlefield there. In the midst of that, he can be being defeated. And when he finally gains the upper hand, some of us, we're being defeated, we gain the upper hand, and we immediately try and go for the kill because we were losing at some point. We want to remove the threat. He gets, he spits, he spits in his face. He's able to take that intense stress response and bring it right down and treat his sword and walk away because the nefs had got, had got involved. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about men operating at a very, very 
um, what may be seemingly high, but to be honest, this is you know somewhat of a basic um, 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 level. Um, but in our age, it, it may appear to be a very um, 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 high um, level. And what Sheikh said is that we as Muslims don't need for the entire congregation to become you know you know these members of the security team. There can be as little as five five men. Right, there can be te te technically as little as three men, two men, you know, and if we're really desperate, one man, you know, but somebody has to do it. There can't be a nobody. There and there's a big nobody. reward. It's a type of ribat, right? It's like f protecting the frontiers of Islam. There was a great reward for that. And this is kind of like that. You're sitting in the masjid, protect, you're taking on the responsibility to protect the jama'at, the, the, the people that are coming for jama'at or the Eid prayers or whatever function you have. And so there's a great reward in doing that. But I think that uh, the emasculation, the colonization, even for the majority of the masjids in America, especially the masjids that are actually very active, uh, masjids that are very uh, active but will not want to see anybody be a carrier right yeah. because they're scared and it's 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 so f uh funny in a sense that you're living in a country that allows you to protect yourself and you're still scared to protect yourself like that's your state of being yeah and it's it's based on these i mean f f one thing i once heard um an imam say when i was in rochester i won't name name, name the mosque but um Imam didn't want the congregation to be scared of members um, carrying and being someone being in uniform. And I put his mind to ease. You know, like, you know, a security guard doesn't have to be this man donned in all black with boots laced up and the pants stuck in his boots like he's, you know, Rambo. You can still be armed and be ready to protect without being in some military BDU um uniform with a vest and everything on uh, as a matter of fact um, if you look at some of the uh, maneuvers that are given to um, people who are on detail uh, I mean like um, like bodyguard detail right um, even over in, pl in places like um, Afghanistan places that are in intense conflict um, special operations members when they're doing um, um, detail for like a secretary there they have to blend in with the um, the, the uh, uh, locals, right? They don't go in this super duper advanced um, gear. They are, uh, I, mean, I wish I had pictures. Uh, you see seals wearing shalwar kameez, right? And they can blend their weaponry in with that um, that um, the, the garb. So it doesn't have to be this this this, this boogeyman type of figure at the front door scaring away um, the congregation. Um, and to be honest, from a tactical standpoint, you want someone who is defending to look like a normal member of the mosque because you don't want him to become a target, right? And that is what happens um, very often when, when we want to get into security. We want to put on the 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 the, um, the dress, put on this this costume, so we can feel like we're doing something. But in reality, the the most tactical way is to look like you're a nobody. Um, even when it comes to gray man theory. They talk about, and I'm just giving you the, the extent here. One of the guys who I trained with, he has his um, weapon in his back seat in a um, Fortnite backpack. You know, the game, the, the video game Fortnite. So if someone was to be approaching his vehicle, they wouldn't rob his vehicle. And if he's taking his gun from his house to his, from his car to his house, no one would see, oh, that guy has something in his, in his vehicle. He must be, where, you know, like, you know, or just I did the show off, like the guy has the military backpack with the <coughs> flag patch on it, this patch on it, that patch. These are things that, like, I really, when it comes to um, guys who know what they're doing, um, they don't they do not do these things. Um, now, if there's a need for that, let's say you're working at a bank, that those are all different scenarios. You will see guys still wearing uniform but in our context as Muslims at Masajid all these things have to be taken into um, account here and this is why learning how to defend your mosque from a reputable person who knows what they're doing not someone who's trying to um, you know look the part but security is about being the part and you'll learn that very quick quickly when something goes down the difference between looking the part and being the part because um, just looking the part can um, be, 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 be very dangerous if it's um, you know, not done right. So, one of the people in America 
that was working in this direction was Imam Jamil Amin. And he had, at one time, I think the third largest organization in this country. He had over like 40 masjids under, uh, under his leadership. And when you're organized, what happens, this is before he was put in prison, that situation aside, um, before he was put in prison, he had things so organized that the city, uh, Atlantic City, uh, uh, city of Atlanta, had given him a citizen's uh, badge that he could arrest. Uh, I, I forget what it was, but he could arrest like a citizen. That's how much they, because when, like for example here in Buffalo, right, the cops noticed because of the presence of Muslims, crimes went down in Buffalo, right? And of course, after COVID-19, cr crimes are trying to creep back up because humanity is in such shambles right now. And so, but anyway, the point being that Imam Jamil Amin uh, was one of the few people that uh, I actually introduced him to my sheikh. Uh, he had come and, and, and they'd gotten to know each other. And then Imam Jamil Amin spent two months with my sheikh in Pakistan at that time. And when he came back, you know, uh, he was still, this thing hadn't happened which when he was, but he was very strong on security and his people were very strong on security. And, uh, and it really leaves an impact. I mean, it leaves a very positive impact even with law enforcement. Oh, because, yeah. you know, you, and so you have that model that Imam Jamil Amin kind of like established in a sense. Uh, which was very powerful. Malcolm X did it before him, right? Yeah. If if you look at his life, he also had the people FOI, around him. The that FOI was was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like pretty you know. bad dudes. So uh, it's very important for Muslims to seriously consider uh, getting an. Ar it's part of manhood. You know, it's it's part of finding your manhood again. And for masjids not to do this, it just means you're still stuck in, in, in a docile state. Uh, and so I want to challenge the Muslim masjids in the West especially to, to, you know, to take ownership of security and the qualities that manhood has, especially now we have the New Zealand event that happened. We've had plenty of other events happen. More Muslims have been killed in the last two, three years by Muslim haters yeah. uh, than any time. Uh, and th some of these organizations are very large. And if you're not ready, it's, it's going to be very painful. So as the economy goes down, as uh, the white people of America Right, and and I'll say this, and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but if you feel as an immigrant, your masjid's not ready to uh, become a man, uh, take its own security, then this the the part of you know what part of this failure is the lack of uh, muhajirin and ansar relationship between immigrants and African Americans, right? Because when the immigrants came. The immigrants followed the lead of the Ansar, mm. right? Okay. And what Muslims, when they came here, instead of looking at African American Muslims, oh, you guys don't know nothing, right? They should have had the attitude that because you know what, if you tell an African American Muslim, hey brother, can you you know get a license for a gun because we need protection in masjid, all things being equal, he won't he won't hesitate. Yeah. Right? African American Muslims don't have that colonial baggage, that fear, that anxiety of, oh, I'm going to carry a gun, what's going to happen, right? Uh, it's almost like you're not a gentleman if you carry a gun, which yeah. is like so weird if you look at the prophet, it's completely in contrast to that. You're not, you're not a gentleman if you're not able to protect your community. Uh, so if you're, if you're uncomfortable, then approach some of the African American Muslims who are more manly than and more responsible and mature, meaning they're, you're not going to ask somebody with mental Ill, health illnesses, but if there's an African American Muslim in your community that's willing to do that, then let him do that and appreciate that. Um, but if you, 
and 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 trust me, that African American Muslim brother will probably be better at putting his life at risk for the Muslims than if an immigrant had a gun yeah. <laughs> and he had to at that moment risk his life. Uh, unfortunately, that's the situation, and I think one of the big blunders Muslims in America did is the separation of the African American Muslims from the immigrants. This was one of the biggest mainstream uh, blunders that happened. And, you know, I think it was fault of both sides, uh, but it was more the fault of the immigrants. Mm. Uh, m more fault of the immigrants, because in Mus Muslims should have allowed African Americans to take the leadership. They wanted to teach the deen, you know more deen, okay, teach your deen. But it should have been under, because they had the courage and the boldness and the knowledge and the history that would have put Islam and that one in Islam in America especially way ahead if oh, they yeah. had done that. But that's, you know, whatever Allah willed happened. And I think that we're entering a new phase now, which is a very dangerous phase that uh, less and less people are going to the masjids. Muslims are less protected. Right, especially good Muslims are less protected. Uh, board members are of different masajids across the country are completely not in touch with what's happening on the ground. Right, they don't have the, because the people that are board members they usually don't meet with the musallis, the people that pray in the masjid. Yep. they don't have a strong friendship with them. And so, and then you got the rich masjids in the suburbs, you got the poor masjids in the in in the in the what you can call the ghettos. So you got all this thing going on. In the meantime, what's happening is hate in America is increasing. Uh, the risk of Muslim lives is increasing. Racism is increasing. Uh, it's uh, we're going through and we're going through and we will be going through a new phase of anti. Muslim sentiments mm. uh, and so if you want to hold on to the deen I don't see how one can hold on to traditional Islam authentic Islam without a jama'ah without uh, a sense of security for that jama'ah because uh, otherwise you know you're just a target and just a matter of time when you're turn comes. And I do want to address the extremes because he mentioned something good here as being a part of a jama'ah and it reminded me of a different extreme too that I also touch on but it's well known amongst guys I mean you see in the movies all the time and I'm mentioning that it's only in movies that the one guy versus everyone else and him trying to defend himself and he can take out all these guys at one time um, that's not real. That, that's that, that's not how that how that will go down or can go down or has ever gone down. Um, those situations are rare, and usually, even situations where I've heard, uh, like one guy making it out, he usually made it out with numerous amount of bullet holes in them. So you don't you don't want to be that guy. Um, just find find the jamaa, and if you're gonna get into the idea of firearms training or tactical training. Definitely try to find a group of people who are on the same um, uh, way as you are and see if you can connect with them. Um, this isn't necessarily a call to join any NRA group or any group like that. Uh, however, if you find a group of Muslims or brothers who, are, who also want to do the same thing, it is much easier to do it with a group of guys than to do it on your own. Um, um, that's number one. Number two is that we don't want to get into the extreme of reliance upon these things um weapons are necessary but if you don't have you know the du'as and the word the morning word the evening word for the protection you know you you can only make it so far and if anything does go wrong it will go completely wrong instead of you having some kind of a sentence there and that is very real we've we've experienced that in buffalo at our mosque, we've seen the power of these protective du'as to the point where there was no need for any, you know, uh, human intervention. Uh, but, to, uh, you know, without going into the details, these things have been seen, you know, uh, you know, Ayn. So the idea of finding a, a group to do it with and uh, make sure you have a balance between that spiritual protection and, um, you know, uh, physical protection because you don't want to rely upon what's in your hand more than uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, one story I'll share is that, um, you know, 
I'll give you the, the, the ending of the story. Brother had told me that he had, he had this concealed carry. And uh, he realized at a certain point that he was going to his gun first and not to Allah first. Right? That's really important uh, self-analysis there because that's obviously you want the opposite to happen. You want to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and then your weapon. And that's only um, gained with spiritual practice. So we don't want to become people who are trying to survive every scenario because uh you know the hard truth is that there's no way to prepare for every single scenario and um you do have to prepare for the the, the scenario that might be the last scenario so um that must be also at the forefront of um this um this this training um yeah so um i'm sorry one more thing i'm sorry yeah Getting in, speaking about the scenarios, you don't want to train for every scenario. That's that's actually very um, non-progressive. If you look at the reason why the military, mostly here in the U.S., I'm not sure about other countries, what's the reason for all these units? Right, you have so many different types of special forces units. You have SEALs, you have MARSOC, you have um, uh, Rangers, you have this, you have that. There's so many many out there. Is because there's no group, there's no man that can be ready for every single scenario. It's just not, I mean, you would have to be some unrealistic Rambo character. So, um, train what we call for your, I mean, it's called mission set, right? Everyone has their own mission set, meaning that there are certain areas in life that you'll find yourself in the majority of the time, right? If you're not going to be, if, if you're not a person who goes to the bank, you do online banking, don't try and be at the range preparing for some bank robber scenario. When you're not, you're probably not going to be that guy at the bank, right? But if you spend a lot of time at the bank, maybe that's like uh, every Friday run, maybe then, you know, bring, bring that into your um, training routine. But the most important places you want, you want to train for is your home. Right, that's where you're at a lot, and that's where your family is. Right, your vehicle. Right, and your work. Right, and your work. It can be, you know, if you're mobile, that's a different um, scenario because that involves a lot more um, variables. But let's just say you're working at a stationary place, you work at a certain place, that's one place. Know your exits. Right, know how many thresholds, knows how many how many doors. Understand those angles um, to the point. Don't look at it as, oh, I want to become Rambo because a situation can become tactical very quickly, right? When I say tactical, I mean if you're in your, if you're going to your, to your, to your vehicle and there's someone who engages you with weapon that, you know, shoots out project, projectiles, right? A gun, right? Or it can be anything or, or whatever, right? There's so many things out there in, in, uh, nowadays, right? As soon as he begins to move around vehicles, you're now in a tactical situation. You now have to have some kind of tactical skill in order to respond to that threat, all right? So it's not about being Rambo or being, um, you know, or, or going into extremes. It's about just knowing how to deal with your, 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 your the situation you may find yourself in. Learn how to operate in your house. Know how to get from room to room. Know where your people, your family spend most of their time. Um, Understand how your house is, um, is built in case, you know, there's no power. Um, learn how to um be in traffic know how to station your car to where you have a you always have a way out a way to pull out or, or whatever learn how to take off your seatbelt in a way where you can get out your car fast these are all things that you have to practice to um, be effective in situations to protect yourself and your family and i think they're very important and those basics that i just gave that they're just now may seem like they're a little bit you know advanced but you can there's so many portions out there where you can learn this stuff in as simple as a three-day course um it, it's very easy once you learn it you just <coughs> re rehearse it once a week or once a month or twice a month it isn't a lot you don't have to you know d d dedicate your life to this it's, it's it's getting the getting the basic training and then just practicing it that's really what it is and if you can get muslims that are like-minded uh that are within a jama or uh, or as a jama uh, that, you know, that kind of like make this their hobby or their passion. That's actually a good thing because we need more of that. And, uh, and, and this is actually one way for people to come. This is a strong, I think, passion that can bring the right type of Muslims together in a very crucial 
a point in our history. To, it's it's a very important skill set, uh, and then you know then they teach it to others and and so on and so forth. And so I think this is a uh, very um, important thing for Muslims to get involved in. And of course, we could talk about that, you know, whether it happens or not, uh, and how practical it is or not practical uh, in different places. Uh, that you know, that uh, will they try to do gun control and all these things? Uh, if they do, they'll do it at a time where the the world will be in such a mess that they have to say stop the guns right so uh because the governments at that time will not be able to control society because of lack of food and lack of water and uh, wherever the world is headed if you see what's happening in ukraine the whole world is shifting now alliances are shifting political alliances are shifting what is happening to the economy the food shortages uh the the shortages at all levels, the shortages of, of, of uh, especially Muslims in Europe are well aware of this, that uh, the, the, the energy shortage that's happening, the food shortage that's happening. So these all these things will have a domino effect. The first country is already, uh, Sri Lanka has already declared bankruptcy. Uh, other countries are going to follow after that. So uh, we're headed to a world, in a world where there's going to be a lot of social instability. And social instability means, and if Muslims can just understand this, that we are, the dice is already cast and we're all headed towards social instability. Every city will have social instability. And if in that, it's, it, it, for one thing, we have to plan to get out of that situation and do hijrah somewhere. But if you, for the meantime, even to do hijrah, you need a security-minded team, or just as a jama, that can deal with that onslaught of, of instability as it happens. And so this is going to be very important. If Muslims don't start doing this now, it may be too late uh, very soon. I don't mean very soon like tomorrow, but things are moving in that direction, like I said, and only Allah knows the real timing of it, right? Things are going to go down. I don't know how long it'll take for the Titanic to sink. I can only tell you that there's a big hole and it's going to sink. So, any last words? Um, to be honest, I feel like everyone should be realistic when they approach this. Um, do not get um, gung-ho happy. That's very common that um, that, that happens. Uh, definitely take it in steps um, all the way to, you know, find out your, your local gun laws, right? Lo navigating those things can be pretty complex, but you can definitely find um, information online. Just make sure your information you get offline is up to date and um, reliable. Um, you can look up your local statutes online. It's very easy. Um, understanding your gun laws, right? And then once you understand your gun laws, make sure you don't just buy the gun you saw on the last action movie you 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 um you uh, you saw. Know how to buy a gun. Information like this can be found online. What I mean is that don't buy an AR-15 if you live in a um, a house that you know isn't isn't. That 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 that, that, that kind of uh, rifle isn't needed. If you want to buy a pistol, a pistol might be more real, um, more re realistic, right? Um, maybe a shotgun um, is needed. Maybe, maybe an AR is needed. You know, um, uh, make sure you're approaching it correctly. Make sure that weapon is good for you. For you, right? Don't buy a Desert Eagle if you have you know smaller hands. Make sure you know um, um, the gun that you're buying. Make sure you, you that this gun, this gun is going to be the gun you're using in pretty uh, 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 stressful situations. Make sure you know how to use it. Shooting is hard, right? Shooting at a flat range, and hitting a target accurately is even harder. Shooting under stress accurately is even harder. So you have to make sure these are all things you're training. Because so when you buy a gun, you <coughs> learn how to do that because the stress response can be pretty overwhelming depending on the kind of person you are but um that gun can be can be very uh, can be very well 
you know, useless to you or be taken from you if not um, trained well. And I've seen that multiple times. So, um, I want to end this, uh, Muhammad, with the hadith of the Prophet Nu'aim bin Hamad narrates a hadith. And I don't want to scare anyone, but it's going to happen. If the hadith is true and the Prophet said it, it's going to happen. The Prophet said, وسلم, there will come a time in the West where Muslims will be butchered. And I suspect that will be as the Jewish people in mass start leaving for Jerusalem. And the world will be looking for who to blame, especially in the West. And there will be a, you know, a lash out on Muslims at that time. So the hadith does not say Muslims will be eradicated. It says the Muslims will be butchered. And so it is absolutely imperative, not just because of this narration of the Prophet ﷺ, but when you look at the real situation in front of us, and then add this hadith to it, and the verses of the Qur'an that we were talking about, that what will happen to all of the different cities across the world, uh, which I think in, in these this time is the most important verse of the Qur'an, in Qariyatin, there will be no city, no town, إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُحْلِكُهَا Except we will destroy it قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Before the Day of Judgment. So how will all the cities come down? It'll be a globalized world. And it will happen. It's an event that's going to happen before the Day of Judgment. And Allah said, or we will severely punish it. So as, and the Prophet said, وسلم, very important narration, the last of the Muslim cities to go down will be Medina. So when the Prophet says, Imran al-Bayt al-Maqdis, the rise of Jerusalem will be the fall of Yathrib. As Medina goes back into a no man's land, literally, right? What will be the situation of the world at that time? If Medina and all the Islamic cities and all the cities of the world have gone down, and Medina will be the last one of them to go down, that means there will be no Saudi regime. That means there will be no America, because America is not protecting Saudi and its beloved uh, kingship that they have a uh, relationship with in that situation what will be your security right what will you be doing to secure secure the Muslims and to se who cares about us who because the main thing is protecting Islam right so Islam is like that light and the wind is blowing and you're trying to like protect that light from blowing out that's that's our job it's not to protect ourselves it's to protect the deen so uh, any serious Muslim has to get involved in the idea of security and has to bring it to their board of directors or if they have an Amir to the Amir, if you have board of directors, bring it up there or just do it individually because no one's stopping you by law to do it individually, right? Because these things are going to happen and it has to be done, as Brother Muhammad said, with serious deliberation. It's not... Uh, it's not a joke. It has to be done with serious deliberation. And I would say, if you're a Muslim that wants to do this, but you're on pills, or you're taking medication, or you've ever been uh, admitted to the mental uh, institute for some reason, or you have a lot of stress, or you're going through divorce in your life, or any troubles in your life, uh, unless you're married, and I would say, at least for this video, for now, at least until you're 30 or 40 years old, like mature, you have good relationships, you have, uh, you know, you have stable relationships in your life, then this video is not for you. This video is for the people that are stable in their mind, in their thought, have a religious mindset, have good relationships, uh, have, uh, have the ability to uh, live a stable life. This video is for them. Okay, so it's, and so I just wanted that to also be clear because we need this task to be taken up by serious people with serious deliberation. Okay, I'll just end on that inshallah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.